Our first speaker is uh, Massimo Verida from uh, Intel. Massimo is a senior director of Intel's worldwide structured ASIC design centers. His team is responsible for taking customer designs and implementing them on the eASIC platforms. His team has completed over 300 eASIC designs, and he will be presenting the industry's first structured ASIC for 5G, AI, and the edge. OK. So hi, thanks to you for thank you for introducing me. As uh, as it said, I'm in charge of the customer engineering for uh, the Intel structured ASIC uh, technology. So um, what I will do today is first let me put things in context. As you probably are, are aware, Intel has multiple ways of. Uh, addressing uh, the market in the next uh, generation computing era. Um, the structured ASIC technology fits in the pillar, which is called XPU architectures, along with uh, other custom logic programmable technologies, such as FPGAs and uh, uh, custom ASICs. <clears throat> what I will do today, I will go briefly over uh, introducing what is the EASIC or structured ASIC technology that Intel offers, what are its benefits and advantages. Uh, then I will go a little bit more into the details of the latest uh, architecture codenamed N5X. Um, and then a few comments on design flow and uh, uh, quality and reliability. So let me get into the introduction. Um, at Pintel, we see the world of custom logic as a continuum <clears throat> from FPGAs, which have the highest flexibility, you know, wonderful technology, uh, where you can uh, uh, upload any circuitry uh, you want and uh, have uh, significant performance improvements compared to, for example, standard process or technologies. At the other end of the spectrum, you have custom ASICs which um, obviously allow you to achieve the optimal uh, performance power and unit cost. Um, what are the shortcomings or the limitations of these two architectures? FPGAs uh, can be uh, pricey in the sense unit cost can be relatively high, uh, the power can be also high and the performance can be limited. In ASICs, you overcome these limitations. However, you have long development time and you have high introduction cost, NRE cost, right? The structured ASIC is a technology that addresses the market in the middle, so to speak, where um, you can achieve significant power reduction and cost reduction compared to a PGA, though not quite as deep as you could go with ASIC, and significantly lower, at significantly lower uh, NRE. I will describe more in detail uh, how and why. Where does it fit in the market? Um, being a custom logic technology, it can fit uh, horizontally across any market where custom logic solutions are required, much like FPGAs and ASICs. Um, at Intel, we have decided to focus on markets that are relevant uh, for the overall Intel strategy. And so, as you will see, uh, we are uh, focusing on technologies that are at the edge of the infrastructure, the communication infrastructure and the cloud, and uh, military and aerospace, kind of a, a separate uh, but very important niche. So <clears throat> around and at the edge of the communication infrastructure and cloud, well, our main focus is on 5G connectivity. Um, I will explain a little, this in a little bit more detail uh, later. I have a a slide on Oran where I can uh, qualify a little bit better these statements, but uh, uh, our focus is on uh, uh, radio access networks and in the intermediate layer between the radio access network and the central office. Then you have, then we have also, we add a lot of value and we have a lot of marketing focus uh, in uh, areas that require data processing using machine learning and what's called AI or artificial intelligence. Um, both for, uh, for example, uh, processing streams of video or, or other um, 
information that gets into the cloud or in the phase of storing this information into the cloud, right, in the storage. Um, and of course, any edge computing, any data processing that is uh, required uh, while moving data in and out of the cloud uh, is also a, an area of big focus, which is an area dominated by FPGAs and in sometimes uh, high requirement of producing especially power. Then, as I said last but not least, uh, the military and aerospace market, you may have seen a couple of weeks ago, Intel made an announcement, a uh, news bite or press release about a program that started together with DARPA where uh, Intel is going to develop a structured ASIC technology in an onshore advanced CMOS facility, uh, which has been uh, required, requested by uh, the US government. Okay, um, with that, let me get a little bit more into the benefits and advantages of uh, this structured ASIC architecture. As I said, this fits right in the middle between FPGAs and custom ASICs. So comparing it to FPGAs, you can get lower power. Uh, there are many benchmarks we've run and uh, we average just about 50% uh, lower power compared to an FPGA. An FPGA. Uh, for the same functionality, we also, structured ASIC technology also uh, brings a significantly smaller die size, which results in a lower unit price. Uh, compared to ASIC, the development time is significantly better. We have seen it can be, you know, half or even less of the time, but also significantly less effort because the team required to, to implement a structured ASIC is significantly smaller than what you need to develop a custom ASIC. Um, of course, Intel offers both FPGAs and ASICs as well. So we have pretty good knowledge of uh, the whole continuum as I described it before. In short, uh, structured ASIC is an ideal technology for replacing FPGAs where uh, FPGAs cannot achieve the ad adequate levels of performance or power or cost. Okay, you can of course, read the disclaimers later in the handouts. How do we get there? In order to do this, let me first uh, give you a brief, very high level description of uh, a generic FPGA architecture. This applies to any FPGA architecture, specifically to the Intel FPGA architecture. What you have in an FPGA, you have uh, custom logic, it's represented here by this uh, plot. You have static RAM memory right, in blocks, and then you will have interconnect. Now, both the logic and the memory are configured using static memory cells. Right? The interconnect is uh, implemented using multiplexers that are also uh, programmed, uh, configured using static memory cells. In the end, you have a large amount of these multiplexers and static memory cells, both for logic configuring and interconnect. So this is the greatest benefit of an FPGA architecture because you can, in very, very short time, program any function you want into uh, the same chip. On the other hand, you pay a price for it, right? All these, uh, all these uh, elements uh, take in static power as well as area. Now, what we do with uh, uh, ASIC technology, we, we migrate all of this into the metal stack. A limited, very limited set of uh, metals, what we call the via masks. Uh, you know, we use a few, a small number of via masks to configure the metal stack. So instead of using multiplexers to connect from point to point, we use the same technique that is used also in ASICs for routing. Uh, one one point to to the other right so the interconnect is significantly uh, improved in terms of area in terms of power now 
The same thing applies also to the logic. <clears throat> we also use these vias to configure logic gates that are part of our uh, structured ASIC architecture, um, which is not made of LUTs and RAMs. It's made of uh, uh, direct logic that can be configured uh, in the via layers. Other important uh, notes. All inactive components are grounded, so they cannot draw any uh, static power, whereas obviously that cannot be achieved in FPGA. <clears throat> and um, the number of active components required, again, as I explained before, in order to do the interconnect is significantly lower because all the switching is done directly in the metal layer, in the metal stack, and not uh, using the base layers, you know, with multiplexers and, uh, and selects done with memory cells. Okay. Okay. Next. Now, let me get a little bit deeper into what it is the uh, latest N5X architecture that Intel offers as structured ASIC. Here is a symbolic bird's eye view of how it looks uh, in a floor plan, floor plan view of uh, one of the different arrays in, in this architecture. And I will show you uh, also a, a table of the arrays we offer later on. So <clears throat> as you can see in the center, you have the core logic and the memory. Uh, these are uh, logic cells, what we call E cells, and uh, memory blocks of uh, 10 kilobits each, very similar to, to what you would get also in an FPGA. Uh, on top of that, we also offer uh, smaller register files, 120 bit register files for uh, better applic you know, application, uh, being more specific in applications. Um, now, if, you, if I move for a second to the right side of, uh, of the picture, just to illustrate the rest of the logic components, we have a number of transceiver quads, right? Each of the gray blocks that you see in this picture represents four lanes of uh, 32 gig, uh, 32 gigabit per second transceivers. Independent lanes, RX and TX, they can be used and turned off independently they can be configured at different speeds as long as they are within, of course, uh, the single reference clock. So as long as they are within a certain integer divide. <clears throat> uh, it's a very wide range uh, transceiver, meaning that there are no great gaps. It, you can go from, from uh, one gigabit to 32 gigabit in a continuum. And it supports a wide variety of protocols. I don't know. How, just we we'll just mentioned uh, 25 gig Ethernet and uh, PCI Express Gen 4 as an example. It's also compatible with Gen 5, uh, although we don't currently support Gen 5. Then we have the standard or the GPIO, if you want, which are uh, high speed configurable uh, IO that can go up to 1.8 volts, support up to 1.8 volt and uh, as low as uh, 1.2 volts. With these IOs, we can support, for example, uh, DDR4 at uh, 3,200 uh, megabit per second. As part of the IO area, we also have PLLs and DLLs that allow you to implement all kinds of uh, clocking and uh, logic synchronization. The DLLs are obviously needed to implement the DDR5s. All is, you see, surrounded, it's not quite like that, but symbolically, you see, we have this DFT ring, which is uh, something I will describe a little bit late, better later in, in the quality section of my presentation, but it's it's all baked in, right? All the DFT is pre-inserted in, uh, in this platform. And now, last but not least, let me talk about the big innovation that we uh, introduced with this N5X technology, as opposed to previous technologies offered uh, by uh, also by Intel. We added the uh, hard processor subsystems or, or HPS, which is uh, compatible to the Intel FPG, what's offered by the Intel FPGA families. It's a quad arm Cortex A53 processor 
that can run as uh, high as 1.5 uh, gigabit per uh, sorry gigahertz <laughs> clock. Uh, also, uh, there's a DRAM interface that supports DDR4, LPDDR4, LPDDR4X. Um, up to 3200 megabit per second rate. Um, this is all capped by the secure device manager, the SDM, also compatible with the one in the FPGA that um, makes uh, this offering of devices um, high, uh, very secure for a wide range of applic applications that require you know, anti tampering as well as. Uh, security in terms of, for example, uh, attestation or um, uh, authentication. Okay. With this. Okay. With this, let me uh, get into the uh, family of arrays that we offer with this architecture. Um, you can see left to right, we have uh, from a relatively small array, uh, less than a million cells, all the way to well over 8 million cells, and in a variety of packages. So this is just for your information. I will skip over this slide fairly quickly. Here is an example of where uh, the ASIC technology, the structured ASIC technology fits in, uh, in this uh, <clears throat> in this space uh, of the ORAN, for example, right? You see here a typical uh, image that you, you can find of the ORAN with the radio access network and then the intermediate layers getting into the cloud. So we have active designs, as we can show here, uh, using uh, Intel ASIC, both in the radio platform itself right? and in the um, DU platform as well. Uh, I've also indicated here how Intel contributes significantly uh, with other very important technologies such as uh, Xeon processor and PGAs. Now, let me talk uh, a little bit about, so how am I doing with time? Let me talk about uh, design flow and uh, quality. Design flow, this is how we engage with customers. It's a little bit of an eye chart here, but uh, bear with me. We, we have, all I wanted to say here is that the mode of engagement is not very different uh, if compared with how uh, you engage with any custom logic, uh, ASIC customer, right? You have a planning phase followed by uh, bringing the code in, the art code in, right? what we call design conversion because the majority of our projects are actually conversions from FPGA codes. Then you go into the layout phase, which is first trial layout because you do many trials to find an optimal solution. And then into a final implementation where you do full-time enclosure and uh, reach tape out. Um, this typically can be uh, in the order of uh, I don't know, three months to eight months, roughly, right? Depending on uh, the complexity of the design. Uh, but it's a it's, uh, significantly lower effort because usually one or two uh, people from, from the Intel side can accomplish all of the tasks uh, required here, while usually in an ASIC environment, you, it takes a little bit more effort, you know, uh, to, to complete all the various tasks, right? So I won't go into uh, all the details here, but uh, uh, you, can, you can see offline that uh, this is a pretty typical flow. Only one comment I'll make, the fact that we bake in uh, a lot of things like, for example, the clock network or the power network, um, and most importantly, the DFT, so it's all automatically reconnected by, by the tools during execution. The place and route tools are custom developed uh, in-house at Intel. Uh, helps significantly in uh, uh, simplifying the flow and achieving uh, quite a bit faster turnaround time compared to uh, regular ASICs. So just a few words uh, at Intel. 
quality is taken very, very seriously. And uh, so structured ASIC technology complies to these requirements. Um, we achieve with this technology significant targets in terms of DPM requirements, right? Defect per million requirements. Um, definitely, you know, better than industry standard, I would say. I'm not quoting any numbers here because it very much depends on uh, the particular design and the coverage that can be achieved. So there's some level of design dependency, but uh, we're always in talking about uh, low hundreds of DPM. Um, all the system validation and board test is, uh, is done to uh, perform full qualification of any uh, array and technology that is uh, pushed in the market uh, by Intel. Okay. Well, somehow we're, we're running a little long here. Yeah. So if you can- Okay, no problem. Up. I'll keep, let's keep the summary. I just wanted to give a, a, a quick summary, but I think I've, I've said enough and I can stop right here. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Go ahead and turn off your screen sharing. I wanna make sure we have some time for a Q&A um, and we're running a little bit behind. So, um, and we do have uh, a few audience questions and I have some questions of my own as well. Um, yeah, find the stop share button and then we can see you full screen. I am trying to stop share. Okay, sorry. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, you mentioned the the high speed uh, 30s on the um, the new platform, uh, 32 gigabit 30. So I'm curious whether um, in the EASIC products you use the EMIB, um, you know, bridging technology and chiplets like uh, we see in the FPGA line. Okay. Um, <clears throat> The current technology, the one that I just described, the N5X, is monolithic and does not use the EMIB technology. However, I also briefly mentioned that we started an engagement with uh, DARPA on our next generation technology, which will be done in an Intel uh, manufacturing process. And that one will support EMIB and external tiles, much like uh, FPGAs. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one of the audience questions has to do with um, smart NICs. Um, you know, the question is whether Intel has a smart NIC using uh, an ASIC, but I guess more broadly, do you see smart NICs as an application um, for these products? Yeah, first of all, definitely, we do see smart NICs as being uh, uh, an application. And of course, Intel does have solutions for smart NICs, and we are in discussion internally, you know, using um, structured ASIC technology. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from the audience: uh, What kind of um, bandwidth or uh, you know numbers of uh, uh, transmitters and receivers can the N5X support in a 5G uh, RU? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I exactly understand how many. Can you can like, you quantify the the bandwidth for a five G RU that this chip can handle? Okay, our, um, we have engaged with customers, um, and we have the, our largest array can support as high as uh, uh, potentially a thirty two T thirty two R type of radio interface. Uh, for, as far as we can go with the current technology. Okay, I think that's what uh, the, this question was looking for. Um, and um, another question um, from the audience, can you prototype and iterate using the, the standard Intel FPGA um, and then uh, move to EASIC without any changes to pinouts or is it uh, not a pin compatible um, path in the, on the hardware side? Um, this is, a, in most cases, the answer is yes. Uh, there are cases where this is uh, difficult to achieve and it, it cannot quite be a perfect drop-in due to uh, compatibility of power rails. So 
there will there will have to be some some board changes. Uh, but uh, in most cases, we have seen that uh, we can get close enough to the original uh, FPGA pinout. So it sounds like kind of layout compatible more than strictly pin compatible. That's correct. Yes. In other words, if if you give the customer guidelines on their layout that they'll be able to design one board that can accommodate both, it sounds like. That's right. Okay. Um, let me just scan audience questions. Um, uh, one question, does N5X imply a five nanometer process? Oh, the N5X technology is implemented using uh, external technology, which is the TSMC 16 nanometer technology. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a question related to the, the FPGA uh, product line. So Intel launched the Stratix 10 NX um, to address machine learning inference. And I'm curious whether that somehow fits in with the EASIC roadmap. Um, we enable, we enable uh, the implementation of uh, inference technology. We have worked with customers that used our uh, architecture and technology to implement inference engines. Uh, we do not have any specific uh, hard blocks in the uh, in the architecture that automatically perform certain functions that are specific to inference. Uh, but it's a generic or, or it's a it's a um, custom logic that can be implemented of any kind. Uh, and therefore, it's very suitable for implementing uh, small processor elements that can be then clustered with uh, uh, wide memory buses and uh, and things that are typical in an AI architecture. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do one last question and then we have to move on. Um, so uh, there's a question about whether you see a transition to optical IOs in the future. Um, I personally do see a transition to optical IO. Uh, Intel is, is working uh, quite hard in, in that direction. And we have programs, uh, research programs currently ongoing uh, to perform studies in, in that direction. As of when and when it will apply to structure basic technology, I really cannot say. Okay, great, thank you.